I felt like I was one of the few people that was actually able to make a difference. That same evening, I was on the Dr. Fauci's desk. I got very frustrated, I must say. I had a moment there. Being able to contribute uh, to ending this pandemic has been very rewarding. Welcome to A Daffodil Blooms in Spring. I am Shira Gordon, aka She Rock Science, and my name is Andrea Prousers, and I uh, direct the Coronavirus Antivirals Program at Vanderbilt University Medical Center uh, in the laboratory of Dr. Mark Dennison. I've been a virologist for 20 years, and it's a pleasure to be here. Fantastic. It's fantastic to have you here. I look forward to sharing your pandemic experience and what happened in 2020 as a researcher and as a person. Thank you for having me. Andrea, in this past year, 2020, it has been a whirlwind for all of us. What is a snapshot of how 2020 has affected you? <laughs> Simple question to ask, difficult question to answer. Um, a, a dream, really. It, it, it still feels like it's it's unreal. Pictures that come to mind are uh, roller coaster, <laughs> as they call it, the Corona coaster. Many ups and downs, fast paced, whirlwinds, exhausting, draining, very fulfilling. I felt like I was one of the few people that was actually able to make a difference, and I was just excited to be involved. Your research has had big implications in both antiviral drugs and Moderna vaccine. That is a lot to accomplish in a year. How does it make you feel? I get goosebumps. Uh, sometimes I get a little emotional, uh, but I think that's also probably because I'm just really tired. <laughs> but it just feels so good to really make a difference. I got forwarded an email from somebody who had received from the severest part of a, a clinical trial. They were done treating her. This was her last resort, and she received from the severe. And a day later, she was on the mint, and she survived. And I, I got that email, and I thought, well, my work here is done. <laughs> I can retire. <laughs> I've done. I've accomplished anything I would have ever wanted to accomplish in my life. Uh, accomplish in my life, and. It was a really good feeling and it just, it just made everything worth it. How many years has the Denison Lab been studying coronaviruses? The Denison Lab has been studying coronavirus for about 30 years, since 1991. So there's a lot of expertise in our laboratory about how coronaviruses replicate. Our actual antivirals program has, uh, was started about seven years ago. So your lab group has been working on antiviral drugs. We were able to adapt that expertise to studying their immune response to the vaccine. What do you want people to know about vaccines? And so there are many ways to develop a vaccine. It gets injected like a vaccine does, and it actually uh, goes into your cells in your arm. But the beauty is that the immune system will then form memory and uh, form components that could neutralize the virus if it was there, and therefore you're going to be protected. Right now there are three vaccines here in the United States. Two are mRNA vaccines made by Moderna and Pfizer. And then there is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which is an adenovirus-based vaccine. People often ask me, which vaccine should I get? And my answer is always the best vaccine is the one that's offered to you first. All vaccines are good, they're safe, they will provide protection. So as soon as you get the opportunity to get a vaccine, no matter which one, get it. If you have had coronavirus or think you had coronavirus, should you get the vaccine? Absolutely, you should get the vaccine. And the reason is uh, the vaccine will actually give you better protection than your natural infection did. Great. Good statement. Okay, so I have a few text messages from you. As early as January 13th, um, you're already working 10 hour days, exhausted off your booty and uh, getting ready for more, more trials. March 3rd, so before it became a pandemic, you're working 12 hour days. March 15th, you needed to be alone, hit a rough spot, completely beat. 12 hour nonstop, little sleep. Personally, I want to thank you uh, for all those long hours. There were very long hours, um, both for the end of our work, but also for the vaccine research. Um, we were constantly working. 
Um, but I, I think that um, it's undeniable. I mean, that, uh, this amount of stress, the, the amount of pressure, the workloads, um, it's not healthy. It's not sustainable. Did you expect it to be closed this long? No, no, I don't think anybody did. I think in the beginning, it looked more like it was going to be a sprint. And I kind of entered it as if it was a sprint. It turned out to be a marathon. And you just get worn out. Um, really a zero to 60 in being uh, in the limelight news wise? Yeah, being in the spotlight was, um, it was a little overwhelming. It's interesting. I've been uh, in the United States for almost 18 years now. And so going back, talking to Dutch reporters about things that I am actually only used to talking in English about, it was pretty challenging. <laughs> normally, normally, as in the last 20 years of doing research, um, what I do um, never ends up in the news. There were things that I knew that I couldn't tell a reporter <laughs> that could actually land me in jail <laughs> if I said something wrong to the wrong person. So that is a, that's a whole other kind of world that opened up to me that I'd never lived in before. So it's been very interesting. Before joining the lab, Andrea, wh where were you? What brought you to uh, coronaviruses? Have you always studied viruses? I wanted to be. I got interested in them when I was a teenager. It just fascinated me. And I, I just thought if I could study that for a living, I would never be bored. I was an insect virologist for the first part of my career, really. So I feel like I finally arrived where I wanted to be as a teenager. I'd like to talk with you a bit about how things affected you personally, because scientists, too, were experiencing the pandemic. I'm, I worry a lot about other people that I love and that they might get sick. And so for me to go into a grocery store, it feels like walking into the BSL-3 laboratory without my respiratory equipment. Uh, it just feels like somewhere I really don't want to be. When do you feel safe? When is your safest moments? I feel safest when I'm working the BSL-3 with my own um, HEPA filter here. Um, with the virus, ironically, that's when I feel safest. Um, I think nobody should see anybody right now. Um, that's the only way to stay truly safe. You've been experiencing this longer than any of us. Let's go back to the beginning. What projects were you working on in your lab at the end of 2019, before the pandemic hit? In general, end of 2019, we were very focused on MERS-CoV antivirals. Thankfully, because apparently it's paid off significantly for SARS-CoV-2. Yes. When SARS-CoV-2 came around, we quickly repeated some of the experiments with the new virus, which turned out to be also antivirals against SARS-CoV-2. So now it's New Year's 2020. We were at a couple New Year's parties together. You were chatting with various people at these New Year's party. What was it like talking to people about your work and coronavirus and their responses. <laughs> Imagine me at a party talking about coronavirus and people just kind of nodding <laughs> and being polite and then, you know, tactfully trying to change the subject. <laughs> people would ask me, oh, so you're a researcher, what do you do? Well, I work on coronaviruses. What? Well, coronaviruses, there are these respiratory viruses. You may have heard of MERS-CoV. Have you heard of SARS-CoV? And, and some people would go, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and some people would be like, no, I, I never heard of that. Why should I care? So at that point, at New Year's 2020, had you realized that it was something that might be at your lab bench very soon? It started in late December of 2019 when we first heard about this mysterious viral pneumonia outbreak. And we were wondering, could this be a coronavirus? I remember vividly, uh, this was January, I think January, oh, it must have been middle of January, I think when it became clear that this is a coronavirus. And um, I was actually fabric shopping with my friends. And I remember I was in that store and I got a phone call from my boss <laughs> and I picked up and he said, okay, I'm on a conference call. We need to talk about this because this is a coronavirus and we need to get ready. We need to start mapping out what our experiments are going to be, what we're going to do first and next and next. And when we get the virus, we are ready to roll. What are your thoughts? <laughs> and I said, well, my thoughts were, should I go with plaid or with fleece? <laughs> so let me think about this for a second. And so I went to laugh and, and we started 
mapping out our, uh, our plans. And that was a Saturday in January. What were those first experiments? What was the first roadmap to what you were going to do? How yeah. do you even start that? Well, we, we already had been working on antivirals for uh, years. And so we had two antivirals that we wanted to test right away. But you can't just test antivirals on a virus. Um, we first needed to understand how well this virus replicated in what cell types. I'm very uh, methodical. Um, I think uh, <laughs> to a fault sometimes. Um, but I wanted to know uh, if we're going to do experiments testing antivirals, we have to set some baseline. Uh, we have to characterize how we work with the virus first. Um, so I started thawing all kinds of different cell lines that I thought might be useful for this virus. So we did our methodical um, infection of cells, harvesting, titering, infection of the next batch of cells, harvesting, titering. Until we had a really good handle on how does this virus replicate in different cell types so that we can then design our drug experiments, which is really what we wanted to get to. We were basically preparing for the virus to come. Our laboratory was one of the first laboratories to receive the virus uh, because uh, we, the CDC knew that we would be able to work with it safely because they come every year to inspect our laboratory. In your current lab, you clearly work with some pretty deadly viruses. Our laboratory uh, at Vanderbilt University Medical Center is not just a biosafety level three laboratory, it's also a select agent laboratory. And select agent is, is not a level up, it actually uh, requires clearance by the FBI um, in order to be able to work there. So speaking of the high level of security that goes into this, it's kind of like the train station in Harry Potter where people don't know where it is unless you know where it is. So some of your lab mates that are not BSL-3 certified don't even know where this facility is on campus. Can you go into that a little more? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's a big secret. It's, it's very exciting. Um, this laboratory is separate from our base laboratory. And uh, I didn't know where it was until I was actually cleared by the FBI um, uh, able to go in because it's, it's on a need to know basis. Uh, we, keep, we keep the location hidden secrets, uh, even from the members of our laboratory that are not trained to work there, which is about two thirds of the laboratory. They don't know where it is and they don't need to know. How does that make you feel about other labs that are starting to work with SARS-CoV-2 and their safety and uh, training to work with the viruses? So when the pandemic started, uh, we were one of maybe a handful of laboratories that were designated to be coronavirus laboratories. And so a lot of other uh, institutions converted their biosafety level three laboratories into laboratories studying coronaviruses. And um, it made me a little bit nervous, to be honest, um, because if you've never worked with a respiratory virus before, um, you don't necessarily have the know-how, even though you work in a, what's designated as a biosafety level three laboratory. And so I have had my concerns about the safety in these other laboratories that went from studying a virus that was maybe uh, transmitted by an insect into the bloodstream, all of a sudden start working on SARS-CoV-2 um, just because um, there's a lot to know about this uh, virus and how to work with it safely. And they didn't know that yet. Were you nervous working with this new coronavirus? We first got a file of this SARS-CoV-2 February 3rd, and I still remember that day that that box arrived, and I was carrying it to the BSL-3, and I was all nervous about it, even though I had been working with MERS-CoV for years, which is a lot more deadly. What about the nerves and caution and precautions that you needed to take? I think part of my nerves came from... Um, we were really going to put our facility and our precautions and our safety mechanisms to the test. No doubt. Nothing like having the world watch you. Can you tell me about what equipment you revved up so that you could successfully and safely handle yeah. what was about to happen? Yeah, so by about March, we got um, looped into Operation Warp Speed, which is the government initiative to develop therapeutics and vaccines against COVID-19. And it was a very fast moving program. Um, and we are literally a very small lab. When you think about ramping up a program like that to test vaccines, like the Moderna vaccine, and all of the tests that needed to be done, with the current equipment we have in there, we, we don't have enough capacity. We, what we really need to do is capacity building first before we can take on all these projects and make promises and really 
and really we couldn't we, we were allowed to buy new equipment but then we ran into other problems like where do we plug them in we don't have any outlets all the circuits are already maxed out in march we actually scheduled a sort of an emergency shutdown of the bsl3 we could decontaminate the entire space to uh, get ready for the onslaught of Moderna <laughs> samples uh, that we were expecting. And we had the electricians come in and pull a bunch of new um, um, electrical circuits and cut holes in the walls for these new outlets that we needed to install new incubators and a new freezer. Uh, and so uh, we had some major, major upgrades done on the facility uh, during a time that we kind of really needed the facility to do our work already. So it was very stressful. Can you walk me through the cycle of one drug. So you get the drug, you've already got these cells culturing. How long does it take yeah. to go through the cycle of testing one drug? It was a learning curve. Um, in the beginning, we kind of did a kind of Stone Age virology way, <laughs> which uh, which took about a, a week uh, per drug to be able to say uh, yes or no. O over time, uh, we, we got more efficient with the types of assays we ran. We started understanding better which cell types were good for what types of tests. And so that you have to learn by trial and error. We definitely um, evolved as we went in terms of the types of assays we used and how useful they were in predicting how well a drug was going to be working in a human lung cell. Um, now we can do it in about two days with the new tools that we have. You said you said yes to everything because ultimately you want this to work. You wanted to have something that's successful in the environment. And so if it meant working an extra day, an extra week, an extra hour, it was worth doing because you want to help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We wanted to help. People were getting sick. People were dying. If there's a drug out there that uh, could help, um, we had a moral obligation to test it. I basically said yes to all of them. So every day, almost every week, I would get boxes of drugs <laughs> that people would send me. It certainly sounds like you had your hands full. Who was in the lab doing the research? During the, um, uh, the, the first months of the pandemic, it was just really Laura and I, a senior research specialist and I working in the BSL-3. We have since trained two other people to work in there. Uh, but Laura and I were really kind of the ones that did the majority of the work um, with the help of everybody else in the lab. So even though people were not trained to work in the BSL-3, they did everything else for us. They plated our cells, they grew our cells, um, they uh, made dilutions, they worked their robots. So I feel like this has been very much a, a group effort, even though Laura and I did, did the BSL-3 work. I think all the other work around it cannot be discounted. Working on the weekends, I know during the spring, I feel like there were several weeks in a row where you went in every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah I must say, uh, you know, I really felt like at some point that the rope was, the weight of the rope was on my shoulders and that was, that was tough. I uh, felt like I couldn't work any harder than I was already working. And so I, I think there were times when it was just really, really tough. Um, it's taken a toll on my health. For sure. Within the past year, we've seen this antiviral drug remdesivir hit the market. Tell me about your lab's involvement in getting remdesivir approved for COVID-19 treatment. I just remember the first experiments I did with remdesivir and molnupiravir. It was one of the first people that actually test these drugs against this virus. And I saw just how potent they were. And I remember that was a, a Grand Rounds, which was um, uh, a big medical center. In-person meeting was one of the last in-person meetings. It was this huge lecture hall full of doctors with white coats. Yeah, she's done some experiments already. She's been working around the clock and showing um, that this drug is effective in, um, against SARS uh, coronavirus 2 in vitro um, and with really good concentrations. So the first data, uh, from this country uh, doing that. And Andrea, I'm just going to point you out, wave your hand over there. This is the person doing this work, and I want to thank her for that great work she's doing. Everybody got up and started cheering and applauding, and I did not know what was happening. <laughs> so it, it was an amazing feeling, and it was the first big kind of rewarding moment that I thought. But uh, it's, 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 it's really terrific work, and... Um, and work well done and, and really important for us right now. Holy cow, <laughs> I'm doing this. 
I think I'm going to make a difference. This is awesome. <laughs> Andrea, you most certainly have. Everyone thanks you for all of your hard work. So you went from drugs and, and the various antiviral drugs, and then you kind of switched gears to vaccine work. I, I was able to finish an important uh, manuscript on remdesivir, um, and that's when I really was needed uh, for the vaccine testing, because that all needed to happen in the BSL-3. And I was one of two people who was really um, used to working there. I see why you feel like you had the weight of the world on your shoulders. Let's talk about Project Warp Speed. What exactly was it and how and why was it so vital and essential for helping get the vaccine developed? So Operation Warp Speed is a collaboration between uh, pharmaceutical companies, academic institutions, and the government. Uh, the government poured $10 billion into it, making sure that we would have a vaccine by the end of the year. That was the goal. By January 2021, we needed to have a vaccine. And unprecedentedly, we have vaccines in less than a year. How is this government funding helping? Vaccine development is not without risk. The government put a lot of money forward to make sure that the logistics um, went as smoothly as possible, that processes could run in parallel. So a lot of the vaccines that are currently under investigation still, uh, they already started producing them in July. So basically that extra money um, took the risk out of the developments and the production of the vaccine. Uh, the Moderna vaccine was backed by the government from the start. The Pfizer vaccine was backed in terms of production. Uh, but both vaccines turn out to be effective. And, uh, and there are more vaccines that are being backed by Operation Warp Speed. It's a good thing the government helps support development and manufacturing of the vaccine at the same time. These steps running in parallel is why we were able to have such a successful vaccine in such a short time. What pitfalls? How many failed experiments were there? How much did you do that ended up being like, well, that was no good, next? There were definitely moments. There were, there were moments um, where um, just the stress just got to me in terms of how much work I had to do and how little, how few people we had to do the work and um, it just overloaded a little bit. I remember um, this was, I think, in June when we were so busy with the Moderna samples. It was a, a Sunday morning and I'd been going for weeks at that time, just with no days off. And, and I was in the BSL-3 and I was inoculating my plates, um, doing the experiments. And I just saw that um, the volumes were not correct. And I, I got very frustrated. I must say I had a moment there <laughs> because the robot had made mistakes. And so therefore my whole experiment was shot. And it was after, normally that, that happens and you, you kind of shake it off and you, you go on and, and try it again the next day. I mean, I think if you're under that much pressure and you're so exhausted and the world around you is on fire, um, it, it affects you in a different way, I think. Um, actually, I, I had to, I had to <laughs> dress out and, 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 and go take a, a deep breath and come back in the afternoon because it was, not, <laughs> it was not good. I can't even imagine the stress. Let's talk about the vaccine trials. What was involved in the process? The first phase one trial was uh, dosing. There were 45 participants in the phase one trial. So there were three different doses that were tried to see how well uh, would these doses be tolerated. These are mRNA vaccines. And so what they are, they are a little piece of messenger RNA. So they are a piece of genetic code that encodes that's basically a blueprint for a tiny piece of the virus that's really important for the immune response. So this mRNA encodes spike. There are little spikes that protrude on the outside that the coronavirus um, uses to attach to the host cell. So it is critical uh, for uh, this virus to infect cells. So our job was to look at neutralizing antibodies. So these are the components of the immune system that actually physically block viral entry into the cells. Um, so antibodies can bind but not neutralize. And then there are antibodies that actually when they bind, they stop the virus from entering. So those are the ones we were most interested in. And those spikes, once they enter into your respiratory system, basically are what help it bind to your respiratory system. And what the vaccine is doing is it's taking basically a shadow of that spike 
So it's not actually putting the, that the virus into your system, but the vaccine is taking something that kind of looks like the spike that would be binding and tricking your immune system to thinking that there is a virus and then building defense against that. That's correct. The, um, the vaccine itself has no virus in it. It's just the genetic code of a small portion of the virus that the immune response can then use to train itself. I mean, I know you're working the long hours because as soon as you are able to get your results out, then Moderna can move on to the next step, right? We were a team. Laura developed a beautiful assay and I was basically just right there with her doing all the assays in parallel. And we just pushed through and, and analyzed all those samples. I still remember um, that first batch of data that we analyzed. Um, we were in the BSL-3. This was a Sunday afternoon again. And the hope was that uh, there would be so much neutralizing antibodies in, in this blood of this um, these volunteers, that it would actually stop the virus from infecting cells. And we could see a dose-dependent effect of the serum of these volunteers. And I just remember looking at the plates, expecting there to be signs that the virus had affected cells, little clearings in the cells that we call plaques. And I didn't see any plaques. And I picked up one plate, and I picked up the next plate, and I said, Laura, I think the experiment failed. I see no plaques. <laughs> and, and then finally, I started seeing plaques, and I said, Laura, you know what that means? <laughs> I, think, I think I know what that means. I think that the serum of these volunteers is super neutralizing, which is a really, really good result for, um, for a vaccine. I saw it over and over again. And I, I was just, we were just ecstatic because we were the first people in the world to see this for the Moderna vaccine that it, that it triggered these neutralizing antibodies at such high levels that it could completely neutralize the virus, even if you diluted it many, many times. And so it was, uh, it was a eureka moment. We were cheering, we were jumping, we were screaming, screaming. <laughs> can, you, can you believe it? This is amazing. Amazing, honestly, that's super exciting. Yeah. That afternoon in the lab, we ended up making graphs out of that. And, um, and that same evening, I was on the Dr. Fauci's desk, those data that we had just generated um, and we couldn't talk about it because this was all um, confidential, right? So we could talk about it amongst each other. We were not talking about it with the rest of the lab. We were not talking about it with our partners. Um, that was all uh, needed to really stay quiet because it would have huge implications. And it did. A few days later, there was a press release from Moderna about our data. It was these two graphs that we had generated. <laughs> our experiment that we had scored with our Sharpie in the BSL-3 that was now talked about in the Wall Street Journal. And it, it just it caused such a wave of excitement. One result <laughs> uh, from, from our experiments and it, it, it causes a 30% increase in Moderna stocks. <laughs> it's, it, it's, um, it's quite, uh, yeah, it's strange. <laughs> <laughs> what did your parents think? They must be so proud. My parents emailed me about it saying, hey, Moderna's in the news. <laughs> Do you know about this? And I was like, yes, <laughs> I was the one who collected these data. <laughs> what a thrill and a rush at the same time. Andrea, you have made a difference in the direction of this pandemic twice now. First with the development of antiviral drugs to help sick people, and now showing validity of phase one of the Moderna vaccine. Congratulations. Let's take a break from talking about research. I want to hear about your pandemic life, how the pandemic affected you personally. What was your routine like? Well, yeah, my, my pandemic routine has been um, I get up, um, I would say about six o'clock in the morning, I wake up whether or not my alarm clock goes off, I just don't sleep past 6 a.m. Uh, my brain will, will turn on. <laughs> and then um, I get up, I eat breakfast, I work out, take my shower, go to work, uh, work, 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 <laughs> come home around uh, 7, 7.30 at night. Uh, and in the evenings, I'm just pooped. <laughs> I come home, I sit on the couch, I eat dinner, and I, I watch TV, and I go to, back to work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> kind of sad, but that's kind of my routine. <laughs> it happens. So many people uh, in the world, I would say, 
aimed to pick up new pandemic hobbies. I assume you haven't tried to learn a new language or anything during this time period. Not so much for me. My skill has been doing things, doing twice the amount of work more efficiently. <laughs> and try not to get burned out. That's, that's a skill I acquired. <laughs> yeah. Sure. I know you're a master gardener and a beekeeper, but you haven't even had weekends available. So have your hobbies gotten away from you? Uh, my bees, um, <laughs> both my colonies um, swarmed. They just ran out of space and they decided to split up and, uh, and the queen left with half of the colony. So I lost one hive, unfortunately. In terms of the, the garden though, I, I just threw all of my zinnia seeds from the year before down and I just had massive amounts of zinnia to look at all summer long, <laughs> which is really fun to come home to. Being master gardeners, you need to volunteer a certain number of hours per year. So another thing you lost with the pandemic was your master gardener status. Yeah, they're not that strict about it, but I did definitely stopped showing off and they noticed. <laughs> I mean, they were sad to see me go, but they understood that I had an important mission. So I think once, uh, once my, um, once it's safe again, and once my schedule clears up again, I'll be able to start volunteering again. You were ahead of the game, um, and you and your husband had purchased an RV before the pandemic hit in December. And such a savior, I'm able to take it out, and it's been such a nice thing that we can we can drive for two hours and then spend the night and have our own house with us. We don't have to interact with anybody. Uh, we can go for bike rides, hikes, um, see different parts, just really be away from home for a little bit. Tell me a little bit about your pandemic hair. <laughs> My hair just kind of kept growing. Uh, it was a bob uh, when the pandemic started. Uh, and then I just, um, I didn't really get it cut because I wasn't going to go deal with that. So a lot of people are working from home during the pandemic. Um, clearly, you can't do too much of that, but you do get to do a little of that. And you have Charlie, your cat, with you. Charlie has been my companion throughout this. He's been very snuggly. There were times that I had some work to do at night. I felt the love. There was a purring cat on my wrists while I was working on my laptop. <laughs> Let's uh, continue down the research uh, conversation. So that was summer, was doing vaccine work and working with phase one. How did the summer wrap up for you? What were other experiments that you were doing? What was the rest of your research summer like before the vaccine became approved? Yeah, the, the rest of the summer, it's a little bit fuzzy, to be honest. There was a lot of work to do uh, on the back end for remdesivir and molnupiravir. We were still testing a lot of other drugs. So we started working with the Gates Foundation on screening a library of already FDA approved uh, drugs. Can you talk to me a little bit about how your research has been public published? So in the beginning, a lot of uh, junk was published. A lot of decisions were made based on these rushed studies, such as hydroxychloroquine. Um, the data were were not were not very robust. Yet it was hyped as a drug, and so the media really played a role in making things bigger than they were, um, pushing things through in a way that they would not normally uh, be pushed through uh, in the scientific world. It was very frustrating. Um, because we do good science and careful science and it takes longer. I didn't know what to do first. I was only one person. And what do I do? Do I disprove myths or did I, do I provide more evidence for drugs that I do believe in? I think both are very important, almost equally important. So yeah, I think it made me really anxious because it made me want to work even faster because I knew what we were doing was legit. <laughs> um, so that was really difficult. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you think ultimately having these rush studies hurt the progress? Yeah, yeah, I, I really do. I think a lot of clinical trials were started with, with, the drug, with drugs that um, were kind of doomed to begin with, just because people were desperate. And I, do, I don't blame clinical trialists and doctors. I mean, people were dying and they had nothing. There has been a large global community working together to get these drugs, the good drugs and good vaccines and how does it feel to be a part of that community and how has that pushed things in a positive way? Uh, it's been very exciting to see um, the government companies and academic institutions come together and work together 
companies were more willing to uh, be a little bit more flexible uh, so that they could get their compounds out in the humans and, and make a difference. And I think that is something that's a model I, I hope will, uh, we will keep using when we look at drugs and when we develop drugs against viral disease. At the end of the summer, Moderna started phase three of their vaccine trials. You actually know about this from a different perspective. You enrolled in the trials. That was in August. Vanderbilt turned out to be a trial site for the phase three trial. I signed up for it and I got a call from the study director saying, hey, you want to come in tomorrow? <laughs> so that was exciting. This was a placebo controlled trial. So half of the people that enrolled in the vaccine study received a vaccine. Everything is blinded. Only a computer knows what you got. And you get two shots, they're four weeks apart. The first shot, I had a little bit of a sore arm, but nothing. And I didn't know for sure if I had gotten the vaccine at first because we're blinded to it, we don't know. The nurses don't even know that give, that give the uh, shot. Uh, four weeks later, I received my second shot, which called, they called the boost. The night after that shot, um, I felt it. <laughs> I must say, I, I was a little feverish, I was nauseous, I had muscle aches, I had joint aches. It lasted about a night, so I eventually fell asleep, I woke up, felt fine. Later in the day, I was a little bit tired again. You know, depending on a lot of different factors, it can make you feel a little bit under the weather for a couple of days. Most people experience that after the second shot. So getting the vaccine, you might feel the side effects and have a little fever or nausea, but you cannot get the actual virus from the vaccine. That is correct. I know the rest of fall, you are still pretty busy with experiments, but let's fast forward to December when the Moderna vaccine was officially approved. What was that like for you? I still remember waking up to a text message from a friend in the Netherlands saying, congratulations. <laughs> this is great news. And I said, what news? <laughs> and so I was the last to know it, uh, how effective it was, because we really, uh, we really participated in, in phase one, but we didn't have anything to do with the data analysis for the phase three trials that was all done by an external company. Sure, but you still played a pretty critical role in approval. I bet you were the center of media attention again. My, my phone started ringing, emails came in, reporters in the Netherlands wanting a statement. Um, it was overwhelming. And I, I had to sit down and, and sit, tell myself, okay, take a deep breath. I've been through this before. I spent all day um, reporting and talking to journalists. <laughs> it was just, it was a dream come true. Um, I must say, I did cry a little bit, <laughs> um, just because I always wanted to be in a position where I could do something that would help people. Being able to contribute uh, to ending this pandemic has been very rewarding. It's, it's, it's been very fulfilling. I I'd never would have expected I would have been in a position to do this. Um, hearing that this vaccine is so effective, it was just... It was worth the entire year of um, incredible pressure and hard work. This has definitely been an interesting year. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey with us and with me. And, you know, this is within less than a year of becoming a pandemic. This is now one year later, we have a vaccine. Thank you so much for all of your hard work, Andrea. I want to say one more thing. I think in yeah, terms yeah. of the yes. vaccine, certainly it's a light at the end of the tunnel uh, for a lot of people. It's the beginning of the end, uh, but we're not there yet. Uh, please stay safe. Um, keep social distancing. Keep wearing your mask, even if you've been vaccinated. Uh, we're not there yet. And I think uh, uh, we need to take this, continue to take this very seriously. But there's hope now. There is hope indeed. A daffodil blooms in spring. A daffodil blooms in spring. Thank you, Andrea. Know that spring is around the corner And all of these things waking up inside Though we can't see it 
feel it coming And sometimes Good things just to take time Grass is looking greener Every day Daffodils are rising First sign of spring They will wake up Bunnies will be hopping Cause everyone Needs a little love too Are we done? Hey. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I've asked you like four hours worth of questions. No, three hours worth of questions. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm also, I'm a cheap shark and I'm hurting because I've been smiling so much. Oh. I know, right? <laughs>